What's going on everyone? My name is Spidey and I am a social psychologist, a certified hypnotist, and an award-winning mentalist. And it's funny because when I tell people I'm a mentalist, very often they say, oh, do you watch the show The Mentalist? Can you do the things he does? Quick, what am I thinking? In this video, I'm gonna look at scenes from the hit series The Mentalist, and I'm gonna tell you guys which ones are completely made up by Hollywood, which ones are real techniques that mentalists can actually use, and along the way, I'll even teach you a couple of really cool psychology tips that you can use in your day-to-day -day life. Here we go. So we're gonna start right in the beginning with one of the most impressive scenes that introduces the character of the mentalist, Patrick Jane. Here we go. Okay, so we're looking at some pictures. You really only pretend to like skiing, right? Yes. But you're pleased that your best friend recently gained some weight, about 10 pounds. You wish you'd been more adventurous when you were younger. You love India, but you've never been there. You have trouble sleeping. Your favorite color is blue. I don't understand that you're, you're psychic. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so what a great way to start the show. Right in the beginning, they introduce this character who walks into someone's house, he looks at a couple of pictures, then he sits down with her and he knows all these things about her. It's crazy because when people meet a mentalist, they think that this is what we could do, that we could just look at them and we know what they're thinking and we know things about their lives. And to a certain extent, I would say that mentalists are very intuitive, like we're tuned in and we look for little clues and things, but I would say mostly that the scene we just saw is 95% fiction. Almost no mentalist on this planet is that good at looking at a couple of pictures and making these really specific and accurate guesses. This is one of the biggest misconceptions about mentalists. Mentalism is not based in psychic abilities. It's based mostly in magic tricks. So we have ways to know what you're thinking, but it's never by just looking at a couple of things and knowing all these things about you. That's very, very rare. And as much as I appreciate how cool they make mentalism look in that opening scene, it's just not that accurate. Are you suggesting we drop a prime suspect because he's never won a major? Oh, no, 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 I'm just making a conversation. How'd you do that? Telekinesis. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this scene. I love that they did this right in the beginning of the episode because it sets up a lot of other stuff that's coming up. So he's sitting at a dinner table and the straw just seems to move across the table. This is an old magic trick that a lot of mentalists still do today and it's as simple as blowing on the straw. So you get their focus on the straw and then very subtly without going like <laughs> You just subtly blow a little and that gust of wind will push the straw making it look like you have psychic abilities. You blow on it. That is another way to do it. Now, the great thing about this trick is that in the 70s there was a psychic by the name of James Hydrick, and this guy claimed that he had psychic abilities and the way he would demonstrate that would be by moving pencils and flipping the pages of a, a telephone book apparently with his mind. Well, on national television, James Randi, who is a magician, mentalist, and famous debunker, put some styrofoam packing around a telephone book and challenged this guy to demonstrate again. On television, for like three or four minutes, they showed this guy struggling and focusing, and he couldn't do it, but I met James Randi once, and he told me that in reality, the guy took hours, and then he kept making excuses to why it wasn't working, so having this trick in The Mentalist, especially in a scene where they're about to discuss the reality of psychics, is such a great nod to that. And there's no such thing as psychics. Now they made a very strange decision with this scene, and I'll play it again for you guys to notice, but the first time he does it, you can actually hear him talking. They did a voiceover. Are you suggesting we drop a prime suspect because he's never won a major? Oh, no, 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 I'm just making a conversation. Which is really strange because it rules out the actual method. He can't be blowing if he's talking, and I really don't know why they did that. Maybe it's because, for those who are perceptive, you'll notice that he couldn't have been blowing, so everything he says about psychics being fake is just a lie to throw people off the fact that he actually is psychic. Plot twist! You poor sad man. Oh, watch this, I love this. You're under arrest. Let's I'm go. pointing a gun at you. You really think I would set you up so nicely and let you pull a loaded gun on me? I took the bullets out earlier.
Okay, so I love that scene. This scene basically is the explanation to every magic trick and every mentalism trick in the world. Very often as human beings, we make very big assumptions based on very small evidence. And that's how almost all of magic works. We assume that a deck of cards is normal because we only saw one or two normal cards. We assume the lady's in the box because we saw only her hand. And that's exactly what he uses here to get away from a dangerous situation. He tells a guy who's holding the gun, the guy's own gun, that he took the bullets out. And to support that, he doesn't show bullets. He doesn't in any way prove that he tampered with the gun. He only taps his pockets to produce a little sound with whatever's in there, his keys or whatever. And that for a second convinces the guy, wait a second, he got my bullets enough for him to escape. Allow me to demonstrate this with a fun little game based on an old street hustle that even you could play with your friends. I've got two tins of mint over here. This one is full, this one is empty. I'm gonna mix these around. I want you to try to follow the one that is full. Here we go. If I just give them a mix like this, you can actually see them being very thoroughly mixed up. I don't know if you guys are following this. There. Can you guess where the full one is? If you said this one, you are incorrect. That is empty. But if you said that one, you are again incorrect. They're both empty. The only reason most people think that one of them is full is because I'm making a rattling sound with a different box of mints. And that's all it takes for most people, that small little sound to convince them that that tin has mints in it. You know, rock, paper, scissors? I do. Play me. On three. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> I, I just love that. I love that scene. Um, now, this is the first scene that I'm covering in the video that is 100% fiction. There isn't a single mentalist in the world that could that confidently stand in front of you, play rock, paper, scissors, and beat you every time. There's just no way to do that. We don't know the decision someone's gonna make. We don't know what someone's thinking. Again, we're very good at pretending like we do that, but we always have a more concrete and more deceptive, more sneaky way to know what you're thinking. So if you're making quick decisions like that in a rock, paper, scissors game, we don't have the ability to beat you and you can challenge any mentalist you meet to do that that quickly and I don't think a single one of them will be able to do it unless they get very, very lucky. This is Suit Hovering Rounder. It's Michael Claymore Bennett. Third, Sansa's lawyer. What about him? The widow's scared of him, or, or, or uh, he's reassuring her of something else that she's scared of. Which is it? I don't know. Could be both. Okay, so that's another amazing scene, and this one is 100% possible and based on real psychology. So basically standing at a certain distance away from a woman, he can't hear what she's talking about, but he knows that she's either scared of the person she's talking to or they're discussing something that scares her. He's basically saying that from that distance, he could see that she's scared. This is a nod to one of the greatest psychologists of our time, Mr. Paul Ekman and his book, Emotions Revealed. This is one of the best books about how humans experience emotions and how you can spot emotions on people's faces even when they're trying to hide it. Paul Ekman is the king of microexpressions. In fact, he discovered most of what we know about microexpressions today. And in this book, he talks about five universal emotions. In other words, five emotions that regardless of culture, no matter who you are, where you live, where you were brought up, all humans experience and express these five emotions the same way. And they are fear, joy, sadness, anger, and disgust. He also talks about 
contempt and surprise, but contempt is very similar to disgust and surprise is very close to fear. Now, even right now, looking at these emojis, regardless of where you live in the world, we're all understanding the same thing. Nobody's looking at this one like, oh, look how cute he is, he must be so happy. We all understand certain emotions because we all experience them the exact same way. And in this book, he tells you exactly how to spot all these emotions on someone's face, again, even if they're trying to hide it. So I will leave a link in the description to where you can get this book and start becoming a master mentalist who can know how people are feeling even when they're trying to be sneaky about it. Okay, now before we watch this next one, I want to tell you this. Try it. Do it. What he's saying to do, actually do it yourself. Here we go. I want you to imagine a screen between you and I. On that screen, I want you to project a basic shape. Like a square, but not a square. Got it? Okay. Lock it in. Now I want you to project another shape and put that shape around the shape you already have. Okay. Excellent. Here's the fun part. Now concentrate and project that onto the back of my mind. Look right here. Open up your mind and send it to me. Okay, now I'm starting to feel it. It's a triangle inside a circle. All right. All right, you got me. Hmm, pretty good, huh? You got me and Rigsby the same way. How did you do that? Okay, so let me know in the comments uh, did that work for you? Did you think of the same thing and were you mind blown because this guy read your mind right through the screen? Let me know in the comments how that worked for you. So, this is one of those scenes where I'm 100% sure they had an actual mentalist consulting who wrote that script because almost word for word, that is exactly how a mentalist would do that. In 2017, at the University College London, they conducted a study which determined, like many other studies, that when we're given choices and we have to do something, we often go for the easiest choice, the one that's the most obvious. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description if you guys wanna read more about that study, but basically, mentalists know this, and we use it all the time. In fact, we know, generally speaking, that in certain categories, there are certain things that people are more likely to think of, and I'll show you a few. First, the one you saw with the shapes, if you rule out a square the way he did, most people go for a triangle and a circle. If we tell you to think of a vegetable, go ahead and think of one now, most of you are thinking of carrots. If we say you're driving on a road trip with a couple of friends, you look out the window and you see something, what do you see? Most of you are either thinking of a tree or a car. Finally, if we say you've got a toolbox, you open that toolbox, you take out a tool. What tool are you holding? It's either a hammer or a screwdriver. Let me know in the comments how that worked for you, but mentalists use this all the time. Now, you might be saying to yourself, oh, that seems really obvious, that wouldn't work, you know, I, I don't see anybody using that. Well, I actually used that on national TV in front of millions of people, and I did it to Penn and Teller, two of the most respected magicians on the planet. Imagine, if you will, a toolbox. I reach into that toolbox, I pull out a tool. Any tool at all in the whole world. Not a hammer. Any other tool. What tool would it be? What tool would you imagine? A screwdriver. A screwdriver. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not gonna touch anything, I'm just gonna turn around. A screwdriver. And when I told Teller that all I did was take a guess and go for the most obvious one, he actually gave me a standing ovation for how gutsy of a call I made and I didn't have any other way out except for a silly joke. How many tools can a guy who doesn't talk act out? Can I say what my out was if he didn't say- I want to know your out. If he said anything other than screwdriver, my answer was going to be, all right, I guess Penn was right, mentalism does suck. <laughs> oh, there you go, there you yeah. go. Right? <laughs> thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So it's good enough to really impress Penn and Teller, but did Patrick Jane do it right? Well, there's a little bit of a difference. You see, in most cases, mentalists will never do that to one person as the only trick because there is a margin of error. It's possible that they think of something else or it's possible they're very resistant so they go out of their way to get something that's really unlikely. So 
In most cases, mentalists either use this on a big group of people and say, raise your hand if you thought of a triangle and a circle, and then it's amazing to see that the majority of the people got what he was trying to get from their mind or project to their mind, depending on the presentation. Uh, or sometimes we use it subtly as a lead into another trick. So if it doesn't work, we just brush it off and move on to another trick exactly like I did for Penn and Teller. If it hadn't worked, I would have made a joke, I would have kept going into something else. But when it does hit, it's amazing. If you're interested in learning more about these little psychological subtleties, there is a book by one of the best mentalists in the world, his name is Banachek, and it's called Psychological Subtleties, and I will leave a link in the description for that as well. So there it was, guys. I hope you enjoyed this analysis of scenes from The Mentalist. I hope you learned a couple of fun things that you could try yourself or look more into so you can also become a master mentalist just like Patrick Jane. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of this. Do you want more episodes like this where I break down TV shows and teach you the real psychology that it's based on? Also, please remember to hit that subscribe button and turn those notifications on for more mentalism, magic, and hypnosis. Thanks for watching, guys. See you on the next one.